Hello everyone, and welcome back to Steel Force Welding and Forge. Today, my friends, I am going to walk you through the step-by-step -step process on how I took a pile of scrap metal and wood and transformed it into this beautiful office chair for my new home office. Before we get into it, I want to give a special thank you to all of my subscribers out there. Because of you fine folks, I've managed to afford a brand new tripod, cage, lighting, and adjustable camera setup. You'll be seeing that adjustable camera used a lot more in my future videos with my lathe, so keep an eye out for those. So these two parts here are going to be the square frames for the back and the seat. I got these from my last job because of a failed prototype. If you want to see some of my old work and my old job, uh, Google Thomas Steele, that's S-T-E-E-L-E, -E -E, and that's where I used to build furniture, and thank you to them for donating these a couple of years ago. So the way these work is, these are cut as a, on a laser. You simply bend these in, like so. And then, ooh, that doesn't fit, look at that. <laughs> well, the idea is then that you have a frame here ready to go and then you just weld all these corners. Let's go ahead and give this one a try to see how it looks. Okay, there we can see that fits tight. So I'm gonna have to go through those parts and find another set where it fits. And what we'll do here is we'll bevel all the way around on both sides, put a small, probably TIG weld, and then just leave it. We're not going to bother grinding anything flush. Make sure our parts are square, and then we'll go ahead and build the insides to this. All right, so first we're gonna go through and check our 45s. This guy here, it is slightly over 45, and that is because my tack will probably cool and shrink. So we're gonna go ahead Put a little tack on this corner. Over here. Pretty far out of our 45. Let's see if we can bring that in at all. That's pretty close. So next, we're gonna need to find a way to get this to sit flush tight and also be able to move it. So I think I'm gonna do, put a little tack here on the outside, that way I'll still have flexion and I can put a clamp here and bring it in. All right. Let's check our corners first. Slightly big, which is perfect. Nineteen and a hair over an eighth. Nineteen and a little bit more than a hair over an eighth. Let's tighten that up a little. Right about there. And now what we're gonna do, we're gonna check for square. So for those who may not know, the way you check for square to make sure all these corners are equal is you measure the corner to corner from one side. Here we have 25 and a hair over 11 sixteenths. And then you measure your corner to corner on the other side. 25 and just a hair over 11 sixteenths. So this guy is spot on. Now, if those measurements were different, you would have to squeeze this one way or the other in order to get that measurement to be the same. If it's the same, it means all of your corners are equal. Let's go ahead and tack these corners up. So here's where we're at on the chair. These are pieces of drop from the same frames that you saw before that just don't fit. So I just broke them apart and clamped them onto the seat. So the front of the seat is gonna be here and you can see it's pitched back. Now you can write this on scale paper, figure out your dimensions and your angles, or just do this, take some measurements and just scribe a line on the back on both sides here. And that is your angle for cutting. That's what we're going to go ahead and do. We're going to scribe a line here. I'll take that angle and I'll transfer it, as high, transfer it as high up as I can here. And then also check the angle down here. We'll cut those angles and then these should fit just like so. These will be sitting here and here on the front. Then we'll make sure everything looks good. Then we'll go ahead and weld this frame and then tack these on. So right now I'm just taking a Sharpie. I'm just going to 
I'll use that Sharpie to scribe a line on the back here, and this is just to give me that angle. So here are our legs, number one, number two, and I have them labeled on the frame as well. So here in the fabricating world is how we find and determine angles. So what you need is a tool called a sliding T-bevel. What you can do is you can take this guy, put him over your line, put a little bit of tension on your... Let's just turn it over this way so you guys can see. Put a little bit of tension on this nut. Hold this tight to your part and move this until your line matches up with the sliding t bubble. When it does, tighten it down. And now if you need to know the number of that angle, you take a protractor, you sit it on top, slide it down so that it's sitting flush on top of your sliding t bevel tighten it, and you can see your measurement right there. And our angle is 76 degrees. Now, I don't need to take this and transfer line down here. What I can do is I can simply take this line here, and transfer down here at the bottom, and scribe a line. Go all the way to the bottom, scribe my line, and now I want as much material as I can get on these legs, so I'm going to do this on the top as well. And there we go. Our line has been transferred. I'll go ahead and put these same lines on these other two legs, and then we'll go from there. So here we are at the chop saw. Now this particular chop saw does have certain measurements that are locked in. We have 45 degrees, 30 degrees, blah, 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 all this stuff. So now what do you do when you have a custom measurement? Because, you know, all your measurements may not necessarily fall under this number. This is, again, where the sliding T-bevel comes in handy. Now I still have the same angle as I did before. What we can do is we can pull this lock, set it up, or pull it up, and now we take our sliding T-bevel, we hold it on here like so, I'll actually have to do it this way, because this is going to get in the way. And now, while this is unplugged, we can bring this down. Hopefully you guys can see here. We hold this tight against the fence, push up against the blade, and we turn the fence until it is tight to the blade, which it is right there. So now we bring this up. Now we just simply tighten down this clamp. Let's double check our angle. Absolutely perfect. So the next step is to go ahead and tack these legs on. If you're interested in the details on how to tack and square two pieces of metal together, see the description down below. I have a video where I demonstrated this before. The only difference between this and your typical squaring is that there isn't an angle on here. So instead of tacking the square, what we do and when we hold it up here, we get ready to tack our part. We use this to make sure that our angle is correct. So we're going to go ahead and start tacking this up. All right, so everything is tacked up. Let's go ahead and flip it over, see how it looks. Ooh, that's better than I thought, actually. We got just a hair, a little bit of wobble, but that's easy to get out. Next, I'm gonna go ahead and start cutting the EPE boards for the slats with a chair. The inside measurement of my frames is 17 and an ace, so I'm gonna be cutting these boards at 16 and 15 16 to give me some room for slop. Okay, so here's some quick math for those who may just be delving into the fabrication world. So how do we determine what the distance is between these wooden slats? Well, first we measure the inside measurement of our frame here, which is 15 and 3 eighths. Then we measure the width of our 
boards. That is 2 and 13 sixteenths. Then what we do is we multiply the 2 and 13 sixteenths by 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. That's how many boards will fit in here. And we get 14.0625, which is roughly 14 and a sixteenth. Then what we do is we subtract the inside dimension here, which is our 15 and 3 eighths, which converts to 15.375. We subtract by the total amount of our boards, which is 14.0625, and we get 1.3125. So this is how much is a gap. This is how much of a gap there is when all these boards are put together. So in other words, that. So now what we have to do is we have to equally divide this gap between every board so these boards are spaced evenly. So what we do is we take our 1.3125 inches and we divide it by 6. Now a lot of people would think you have to divide it by 5 because you have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 boards. That is incorrect because while you have 5 boards, you have, as you can see here, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 gaps. So when we divide that by 6, we get 7.30 seconds, which is roughly slightly bigger than 13 sixteenths. So now that we have the spacing for our boards, we can go ahead and build our seat straps. Okay, again, so here's some quick furniture science for you. When it comes to seat straps, you want to use heavy-duty material. When you're sitting on these, depending on how large or small the person is, these straps will have a tendency to sink and to bend down. So you want to use something sturdy. Typically, you want to use something that is at least 3 sixteenths of an inch thick, or preferably bigger, like a quarter inch. So the only quarter inch that I have are these plates here. Now, I could go through and take my plasma cutter and zip some seat straps out of this, which would be sitting in this direction on this seat. I'll probably do two, or I can use this angle iron. This is one by one by eighth inch angle iron. Now, angle iron is very sturdy stuff, so this will work just fine. The only drawback is that I'll have this point here, I'll have this sticking out below the bottom of the wood, but I don't think anyone's going to be crawling underneath this chair, and I can always round this off so I have a nice soft edge. So we'll go ahead, cut three of these, and then we'll figure out our spacing for our holes. Let's go ahead and discuss a little bit more layout for finding the location of these holes for our boards. Now there's two ways you can do this. There's sort of the quick and dirty way, and then there's the uh, longer method that's a little bit more precise, but involves a lot more math. Now the correct way to do this would be to take our gap here, which is 730 seconds, and add half the distance of this slat. And that would roughly come to about an inch and three eighths. So that would be the location for our first hole on both sides. Now, to go from there to find the distance from this hole to our next hole, we would have to add the length of another full board, because we have two halves here, plus the distance here. Now, as you start doing this, and as you go down your measurements, you're going to start getting into the range of 64 of an inch, which is fine, but if you're doing that and you're compounding that error, by the time you get down here, your marks will be off by like an eighth of an inch. So one way to do that that's a little bit easier is, with, especially with a small part like this, all we have to do is we mark out our inch and five-eighths on both sides. So here's our inch and five-eighths here. Here's our inch and five-eighths here. Then we simply find the center of our part. So our part is 15 and 5 sixteenths. So half of that would be uh, a little over 7 and 3 quarters. Or so I thought. Yeah, I got that wrong. The measurement should have been 7 and 5 eighths. So what I ended up doing was putting most of my holes in the wrong location. So I had to fill them with weld, grind them flush, and re-drill them all. But the same concept applies. Just remember to measure twice, cut once, folks. So we'll mark that. Now we find the distance between this mark and this mark. And that should give us the location for this board here. So we are looking at 6 and an eighth, so 3 and a sixteenth will be our location for our other holes. Nope, wrong again. The actual measurement should be 3 inches. 
So if we just kind of visually look at that, and that looks pretty darn good. You can see our marks are pretty much in the center of all of our boards. Now we're gonna go ahead and start drilling our holes. I'm gonna be using a 1 8 of an inch high speed steel drill bit. Now for those who aren't familiar with metal fabrication, that's an important uh, point. A lot of uh, cheaper drill bits will be labeled as something called black oxide. Those are not high speed steel bits and they will just burn themselves out trying to drill through steel. So look for something that's at least high speed steel or if you want to go a step above that in cost and quality go with tungsten carbide but for just the run-of-the-mill home fabricator high speed steel is just fine So while I was cutting the braces for these slats, I also put some 45 degree cuts on the corners of the angle iron. I did this so that I could go through and do what I'm doing now, which is just rounding off those corners and taking all the burrs off. This way, in case my cat goes under my chair or someone brushes up against the back of my chair, they're not gonna be catching a sharp edge on anything and everything will be nice and smooth. The next step, using the pieces of wood that we're going to be using for the backing as height, we're going to go ahead and tack in these braces. They're going to sit about four inches in from the end. Checking for gas. So there is a slight gap in here. All I'm going to do is split that difference. And then we'll go ahead and tack in one corner right here. Then we can come over to this side. Adjust it so that we're on our line, attack in the other corner. We're good. Then we tack in here and here. And push down. Make sure everything stays tight. There we go. Alright, so this guy is ready to go. Now I'm gonna go ahead and tack in the seat. Alright, so the next step is to find the location for our back. Now, me personally, I would like this to come up to about halfway between up my shoulders. For me, that's what's gonna be comfortable. Whatever you would like to do, that's fine. It's personal preference. So when I measured that out, that was about 18 and a half, 19 inches. So that's what we want the height of this to be from the base. So what I think I'm gonna do is cut two pieces of flat stock, put them in here, just in two uh, locations, and we're going to determine the length of those by the height of this. Now, you also don't want your chair to be like parallel to the earth like this. That's not going to be comfy. You want that to sit back a little bit so you can sit back into it, feel comfortable. So let's go ahead and try to determine a height. Now, this is already at 17 inches. So come up two inches. That's probably where we want to be. So I think we'll just take two pieces of steel and cut them at two inches and put them right on here and that's how it's going to be. So here's a little tip on how to lay out cuts for steel. Now some people like to use markers. I personally like to use a scribe. A scribe leaves a permanent mark that will be covered up easily with paint or even very minor sanding touch up. So we're going to go ahead find our two inches and whenever you mark a line for cutting mark it with a V. Now the reason for this is if you just mark a line, that doesn't really signify what side of the line needs to be cut on. Does it need to be cut on the line, on the other side of the line? We make this V, you know that is two inches exactly. So any mark or any cut that I had to do will be on the right side of the line. So now we have our V mark. Now you can take some kind of square, line it up on your part, and now you can scribe your line. The nice thing about a Scribe again is you have a very thin tip. It makes scribing this line very easy. So now we have our two inches. Let's go ahead and take it over to the chop saw and cut it. So just like before, we're going to go ahead and mark this at two inches again. Now this time, because this part is four inches even, we're going to be cutting directly on the line. The kerf, or the amount taken off by my cold saw, is approximately an eighth of an inch. So this will leave us with two pieces that are two inches by an inch and 15 sixteenths. It's a sixteenth short. It's fine. All right, we're back. So now what we're going to do is I have some marks here marked out at three and a half inches. These are gonna serve as the locations for these tabs here. 
that are going to hold up the back of this. Now, I'm not really sure the angle of this, so what we'll do is we'll put four tacks on each corner, so that way we still have some flexibility with this. Then we'll put some wood on here and kind of try to sit it and see how it feels. Then we'll kind of get an understanding of what our angle should be. All right, now we should have enough strength that we can kind of sit in this chair, put the slats on, we can test to see how the back feels. All right, you guys may have an absolute treat here of seeing me make an absolute jackass of myself. Now this is all only tack, so there is a chance, however small, this might just fall apart. Looking at everything, everything looks good so far. Pretty happy with it. Ooh, I'm really nervous. Okay, that definitely is too far forward. Still a little too far forward. You can see you get a lot of flexion with those welds. Right about there feels pretty good. For these armrests, I'm just taking two drop pieces of the frame that didn't fit together at the beginning of the video and just tacking them together at two 90 degree angles. Okay, so I have these armrests just kind of clamped on where I think they should go. We're going to sit down and give them a try. Those actually feel pretty good. And with the wood on there... That actually feels perfect. So we're going to go ahead and mark off where this is right now, and we're going to leave these right where they are. So for the next step, I'm going to be taking a series of these caps and putting them on the ends of these tubes for the armrests. Do it on both sides. Now I want to bevel this a little bit first. I'm going to weld these downhill so that way I can get a nice flat weld. And if I want to, later on I can grind that down and touch it up and sand it smooth and make it look really nice. Now I'm going to go through and drill out the holes to the finished size for the screws. Now it's time to drill the holes in the back of the wood for the screws. Now ePay requires you to constantly clear out the chips, otherwise it tends to kind of gum up and bind up. You can kind of see that happen here at the end. Next, I'm going to go ahead and router all the edges off of the ePay to give it kind of a nice round edge. Next is to hit the ePay boards with 120 grit orbital sander. I'm gonna go ahead and round off the edges and take off any of the old stain that was on these boards prior to me owning them. After a quick wipe down with some degreaser, it's time to go ahead and, and apply a primer to the chair. And for the last step, I'm gonna be painting this chair with a semi-gloss black paint that's specifically designed for metal. For finishing these boards, I decided to go with a dark stain. Now, for those who may not be familiar with stain, the process is to apply a liberal amount to the stain and then to wipe it off before it dries. So now, for what should be the last step in putting this chair together is assembling the wooden slats. 
Now, I forgot that whenever you're using ePay and screws, you need to lubricate the screws. The reason is because ePay is so tough that it's just really difficult to drive screws into them. And I ended up ruining the heads on both of these screws. I had to use channel locks to get them off and scraping the heck out of the bottom of the chair. The correct method is to use a lubricant commonly referred to as tube lube, and you'll see it up here in a second. All you do is dip the screws into this tube lube, and then you can drive these into the boards and they drive in like butter. All right, here we go. Here's the big moment. So we're gonna be seeing this live. I haven't sat in this chair at all since I first tacked it up. So, uh, Everything looks nice. <sighs> that turned out better than I thought. That's almost perfect. The incline from the front of my legs to my back and the angle of the back of the seat is perfect. I feel like I'm sitting in this not to relax, but to get work done. That is exactly what I was hoping for. The armrests feel good too. I was originally planning on putting some wooden armrests on them, but I'm not sure if I'm gonna do that anymore now. They feel pretty good where they are, and I feel like if they were up higher, it probably wouldn't be comfortable. Plus, I'm gonna be sitting over a desk. So, let's get this bad boy in the office and let's uh, see how it looks with the desk. And here are the final results, and I gotta say, they speak for themselves. I'm very happy with how this chair came out. It has the exact modern minimalist look I was kind of going for. The colors look really nice together and I'm really happy with it. So here are my final thoughts on this video. First, what I like. The chair is very comfortable. Everyone who has sat in this chair so far has told me they're surprised at how comfortable it is. And that is again due to the fact that we did small Things like we have the front of the chair higher than the back of the chair. The back of the chair isn't like a straight 90 degrees. It sits back slightly. And the armrests are at a comfortable height. These are all things that I've learned just throughout my years in my trade. Now, things that I would improve upon. Well, first and foremost, no matter how careful you are in a job, if you aren't slow, you don't take your time and really plan things out, you will make mistakes. The biggest mistake I made on this guy is I forgot to measure the height for the bottom of the desk. And... The total height from the armrests. This office is in a small room in the basement. My spare bedroom, there is a large bed down here for guests, and I wanted to be able to slide this chair under my desk to save as much room as possible. Well, the darn armrests are about a quarter inch too high to fit under my desk, so now I've put my desk on risers if I want to be able to slide this under there. So, you know, simple mistake that could have been avoided. Um, in the future, I probably won't be using ePay for any more of my products. Now, ePay is nice because it lasts forever, and if it's inside, it does keep a nice color. But just working with this stuff is such a pain in the butt. It dulls all your tools. It's a pain in the fanny to attach it to anything. I mean, you guys saw in the video how I ate through two screws before I remembered, oh, I need to use some kind of lubricant in order to attach the slats to the chair. Well, that wraps up for today's video. Thank you everyone who has been watching my videos and subscribing. Again, channel keeps slowly growing and it's phenomenal. And thank you for all your subscriptions on being able to afford even better and better video equipment and lighting equipment. Uh, pretty quick here, we're going to be getting into the uh, more advanced realm of as far as improving my videos goes. Like we may be investing into better video editing software, even better microphones, um, some sort of surround lighting and dedicated places in my home for recording. It's starting to get a little bit serious, which is great. So thank you everyone for watching. Please give me a thumbs up, please like, please share, please subscribe. Please leave a comment down below if there's anything you'd like to see in the future. Work hard folks, stay humble.